Hi everyone, my name is Kat Savage and I'm a clinical hypnotherapist and well-being expert working in the creative arts sector. In my line of work, I get to meet some amazing, colourful people, from actors to artists, people who live their lives by their own rules, fueled by passion and determination to bring their unique talents into the world. I wanted to discover what it took for people to leave the usual nine to five and hop on a dream, to capture their bravest moments and share these meaningful conversations with you, so that together we can explore the ideas, emotions and moments that could potentially change our lives too. The Brave Moment podcast starts now, in the middle of the COVID pandemic, probably the bravest moment not only for my guests, but for the whole world. So let's keep talking, have some fun, and enjoy the show. This week on the show, we speak to the wonderful Darren Felber about his life as a vocal coach and musical director for television's The Voice UK, Let It Shine, and with touring national musicals such as Les Mis, Titanic and The Bodyguard. We talk about our mutual love of Switzerland, Darren's home country, tips for achieving your creative dreams, what it's really like to work in television's toughest industry, and even a brush with death. It is with great pleasure that I introduce you to one of the UK's hardest working musical professionals, Mr. Darren Felber. Welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I've been having a really good chat with you before we start recording this, so I'm, I'm already in your world a little bit. Um, but I'd like to take you back to your childhood, really, because I have a massive love of Switzerland, which is, of course, your home country. Tell me what it was like to grow up in such a beautiful place. Oh, amazing. Um, <laughs> the one thing that's really notable, and it's really notable from, from any angle you go, is the light difference, the light quality. England is quite dull in comparison. Mm. Uh, there's just Europe has a certain... Maybe it's because it's closer to the equator, I don't know. But it, there's more light. So that's really notable. And to have two really clear seasons, you've got, you know, the real hot summers. We get 25, 26, 27, up to 30 Celsius, maybe sometimes a bit more. And in the winter, I remember going to school with snow up to my knees. So <laughs> I think... <laughs> <laughs> um, two really great seasons and the country is just beautiful. I mean, if, if you haven't been, you need to go. <laughs> <laughs> Sold. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, our family spends pretty much every other year there. Um, my husband proposed to me out in Kleiner Scheidig, which was awesome. And talking of snow going up to your, <laughs> up to your knees, oh my goodness. So I'd, I'd gone snowboarding the day before and uh, basically just tripped up uh, on the bottom of the slope, twisted my ankle, and then the next day my husband was due to propose to me. So he was like, oh, I've got this lovely spot I want to take you to today. And I was <laughs> effing and blinding all the way up this hill, you know, like limping all the way up like Quasimodo and then right at the top of Kleiner Scheidig which has a beautiful panoramic view of mountains. It was glistening snow, he proposed. And, and it took me a while to say yes, because I was in so much pain. <laughs> but the beauty of the place, just, you know, it's, it's it was magical. And I always think... Uh, like, you know, what smells are evocative of, of those special places in your mind? And for me, Switzerland, the smell of coffee, croissants and cheese is a big thing for me. How about you? Like, what smell evokes bread. home for you? Bread. There's nothing. I mean, <laughs> the, the Swiss have this bread called a top, which is basically like a, a, a woven sort of, of bread, but it's slightly sweet. Um, and I'll smell that a mile off. I know what it is and I want it. <laughs> <laughs> and whenever I go back to Switzerland, that is all I buy. Yeah. <laughs> so you <laughs> just live on bread. <laughs> and, and cheese, yeah. <laughs> all the stereotypical things that we think, you know, Switzerland's famous for is what I eat. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you're a typical Swiss. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, I mean, obviously you grew up in this beautiful country and the space there is so, I don't know, inspiring. Were you creative as a, as a child? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, I was until the age of about 14 
Um, and then I, I had an illness when I was younger, and my muscles were sort of eating themselves in a really weird oh context. Oh, my goodness. Um, what was that called? It, it, well, it, it, it's under the form of MS. So it sits under MS, but it's it's not. It's a kind of like an offshoot of it. They weren't sure what was causing it. How old were you and, at the time? Uh, I, I was diagnosed uh, about eight, so I was really restricted already um, because I couldn't do sports. They wouldn't allow me to do sports. Yeah. Um, and obviously in school, that's a big thing in any mm. country. If you're not taking part in all the things, um, that, that can lead to bullying and all sorts. So for me, um, I spent a lot of my time trying to do different things like sing or, or um, learn guitar, that sort of thing, because I had to find something to fill my time with. Because, you know, when you're getting bullied at school for something that's not your fault and something you don't understand, um, that's difficult to deal with. So I was kind of had that. And then at 14, they gave me an experimental drug um which killed me <laughs> frankly and i was dead for about uh, five minutes um, and... so it literally killed yeah, you yeah, yeah yeah and i was resuscitated <laughs> um just at the point that they were going to give up on me thank you <laughs> and um and after that I've, I've been fine it's like a miracle cure i guess but um yeah it's a really tough time and obviously after that you know when you've it's the strangest thing and i think anyone that hasn't experienced death which probably is most people mm. <laughs> won't understand what it's like having to relearn how to lift your arm how to move how to think everything just is 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 missing and there's a, a, a I can't explain the feeling it's too strange um and it's strange from the point of view of you know, even when I think back to that time, I, when we when we think about times in our lives, we have a period that we can kind of link to with a, a an emotion. I'm emotionless at that time. All I can remember was the pain, the agony of trying to relearn how to, you know, and your brain remembers, but your brain can't do. And that's really difficult to learn. You know, like when I lift my arm now, that's just, not, I'm not even thinking about it, yeah. nor does anyone else. But when you're in that situation, you have to. So that was really difficult. And so, I stopped being creative completely. I just couldn't deal with any of that stuff until I was 19. And then I kind of started to play instruments again and started to sing and... That's unbelievable. Horrific. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, there's two There's two things going on <laughs> in my brain right now. The first one is, number one, near-death experience and what did you experience in that time that you were dead? And number two... <laughs> I mean, the, the motivation it must have taken for you to just keep going through that time. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you both those questions. First of all, let's talk about the motivation to get yourself better again. Yeah, I, I'm, I think I, when you're younger, it's easier. <laughs> That's yeah. the key. When you're a young person, you recover from things easier. And I think my motivation was really just that I wanted to see my friends go out and do things. And I didn't want to be in this sorry state. I didn't Do you want think to you feel kind of like myself. willed your body to get better then? Maybe, maybe. Um, I, I definitely did in terms of the um, the therapy that I had to have in order to, you know, move, mm. um, because that's very much driven by you, not by them. There's only so much they can do in terms of physiotherapy, in terms of exercise. You have to want to move, to mm. move, if that makes sense. The it, the emotional and, and uh, you know side of things that takes time and I, and I don't think I've recovered from that now I don't think mm. you ever do when that happens to you it sticks with you yeah. but you can use that as a source of energy rather than a source of sadness or sorrow or whatever you want to well it's clearly it motivated as. you in the work that you do now hasn't it yeah really? definitely definitely um you know and whenever things are tough I, I can honestly say there's tougher things in life yeah, yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> my goodness I mean you've literally been to death and back again I can't believe it I was not expecting this mic drop moment <laughs> in this interview to be honest Derek so I mean obviously my curious side about that moment that you passed away from the planet were there any weird things that happened in that time I I, I you can't describe the, 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 the there's no feeling but you can't also describe what it's like because there's there's just nothing no space nothing it's just you're there and then you're not and it doesn't help also that they're giving you drugs at the time yeah. so, so actually what what I can remember isn't an awful lot I remember the the coming back yeah which was it was like being a fish in a pond and people yelling at the water that's what it felt like I was semi there but I wasn't there I knew what was happening but I didn't know how to, to deal with anything because yeah. I couldn't I couldn't process it 
It was strange. It was the strangest thing it, it, by a mile that's ever happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, I, mean, I mean, I'm kind of gobsmacked, to be honest. I, and I kind of, I mean, that's an, another interview for another time is, you know, dealing with death. But um, here you are, 19 years old, you've recovered and you've got that sense of movement back in your body. Was the first thing you did was pick up an instrument no. or sing or what did no, you do? I, I, you know, I'd spent a few years um, just learning to be me again, um, going back to education, going back to learning and thinking what I want to do career-wise. Yeah. Um, and I did pick up a guitar at one point during 1920 sort of time to play just for recreation sort of thing. Yeah. And it's like... I don't know, when you're creative and you find something that you want to do, you just ignite when you do it. And there's no feeling like it. It is like electricity, literally. You just feel great. And I felt that when I played. And I had to continue. And then I just started to, to you know, play guitar and sing a bit. And um, just as hobby. Yeah. Just yeah. as hobby. And it wasn't until I was, I think, 22... Um, I moved into my next phase of, of self-killing, of alcohol and and, um, and cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think most creatives, yeah. and, and especially yeah. after your experience, <laughs> have been in that realm. <laughs> I, um, I, I Maybe I was 24, actually, because I'd left university and I, I just, I was gigging probably with the wrong bunch and um, I'd, I just started to drink too much um, yeah. and I knew that I was on a slippery slope but when the creativity stops and it's replaced with with kind of like self-regret yeah. then you know that you have to stop yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I moved home and locked myself in a room for about two weeks and I was the, the most horrible person in the world <laughs> to anyone that came near the room <laughs> um, and I felt great afterwards yeah you exercised the, the demon so to speak yeah yeah yeah, yeah. My goodness, this is such a great life story. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously you said you, you left uni and all of this stuff happened. You didn't actually study music at university, no, did I, you? No, I studied IT um, and then I did, so I did a fast track degree in IT and then I did a second degree in business management. Yeah, which is helping um, now. Which is brilliant yeah, now, but, but yeah. wasn't at the time. And then as soon as I left university, I did some gigging, did some, some playing and um, went through that whole episode and then yeah. left the country. <laughs> <laughs> like you do. Where That's did you go? Much. I came to London <laughs> <laughs> and semi-repeated it. I mean, I, I, minus the alcohol, I suppose, but I was gigging and doing things. Um, and then, you know, I the, the, the problem is in the meantime, kind of in my... I started to learn piano when I was about 20-odd um, and self-taught, just kind of like fiddling away, working out what's mm. what, really. And then I, that became my main instrument and it becomes really difficult when you're gigging mm. to carry that around. I mean, you can't. You have to carry a keyboard. And, and carry by a that, keyboard we're, and we're an talking amp. about a, a huge piano, a beautiful... Is it a baby grand? It, no, it's a full-size. No, it's, it's a full-size. Full it's, it's, uh, well, it's a... It's the first size concert grand, so it's eight feet. Oh, it's quite a beast. <laughs> it is a beast. And I know nothing about pianos, really. So, I mean, looking at it now, it's quite it's quite a presence in the room, isn't it? It's almost like a big mouth, like, waiting it to clamp down on it. takes up all the space, yeah. yeah. Man, so when did, you, when did you actually get this so particular I've, I've, concert grand? This one, I've maybe had for five years now, but I've, I've had many pianos mm. um, from the ones that you kind of get free out the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to nice ones. Um, but this one um, is sort of a hybrid grand, I'm going to call it, because I bought it and it's imported from Japan. Um, How very 2020 of you, darling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we ripped it to pieces and um, it's um, undergone some serious surgery. <laughs> it's be it's absolutely so, beautiful. We might um, have to get you to play a bit in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so coming back, I, I'm, I want to know about some of the stories that this this grant has to say in a moment. But can you remember? Because I mean, obviously, we've been talking so far about, about things that I didn't expect. It, <laughs> but you've done some incredible things with your musical career, haven't you? Tell us some yeah. of the highlights. Um, so I've I've had three um, number ones in Germany from records that I've worked on um, that I've either produced or I've been involved in the creative process of writing um, and I'm really proud of those I mean they're phenomenal pieces of work and I'm, I'm you know I wish I could do more of that yeah <laughs> um, but so I've done some of that and I've, but I've just had amazing opportunities you know I've been for five five years working on The Voice um, and that's been incredible I wouldn't change that for the world mm -hmm. um, 
I've worked on, well, probably just about every national um, kind of theatre company I've uh, d- done some work with, mm. and I've produced probably about 20, 25 national productions, um, which have just been amazing. And, and it's not things that I've expected. Um, I never set out in life to do this. It's just kind of happened. Mm. And, you know, that is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> And I've written probably maybe five albums worth of material that I've never released <laughs> and I shall never release. You're such a selfish creative, not, not Derek. saying they're particularly great. That's why they haven't been released. <laughs> hey, we've all got to start somewhere. They'll come out in like 20 yeah. years after exactly. the really good ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I've got, I've got to wait till I actually do pass away for good because That's then they'll true. be worth some money. <laughs> Posthumous production, I love exactly. it. Exactly. Um, and I've just been really fortunate to do now lots of, of different things in, in television. Television's opened up a whole new world. Mm. Um, but you know, I still try and maintain a, a high level of privacy. Yeah. Um, I use stage names, and actually, I don't sell myself. I sell myself as a company because mm. I don't want any kind of um, media retention of any sorts. Yeah. I like doing what I do, but I like doing it because of the creative aspects, not because of the the, the limelight, the, the limelight, or yeah. the fame, or any of that nonsense that I really don't care for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I mean, it's it's a double edged sword, isn't it? Creativity and, and being successful in the creative industries, because some people really want that. And then they regret it. And then some people like yourself very, very much want to be the backbone of a production or the person that is responsible for keeping it in all of its integrity. And and that's a beautiful place to be as well. And there's so many people on a production that are just quite happy to just be in the background and, and support it. But talking of productions, can you remember your first big thing that you were a part of and where were you (laughs) the most embarrassing thing (laughs) of my life um and the reason that i stopped being frontline (laughs) um i was in a production of joseph i was playing joseph it was at the london palladium i'd just come to the uk and i'd um, auditioned for this role and at the time i wanted to be frontline look at me i'm glamorous so it was very much hello darlings this whole you know that whole (laughs) approach and uh and it was just the most embarrassing thing in my life um the 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 theatre sold out and I, and it was brilliant. I mean, we did a good run of it, and I tried. I no, I just walked away from it, going, "This isn't me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want the attention. I don't want people, you know, collaring me in the street. I don't want media stood outside trying to catch me on camera yeah, when I'm yeah. off guard. I don't want any of that. I just want to have some gratification for the work I've done, not yeah. for for any sort of like, look at me, look how good I am, look how, you know, how fabulous I am. I'm, I'm not interested in that. Mm. And uh, that was that. <laughs> <laughs> Your moment my, in the My sort of first and last um, bit of acting and singing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty big decision to make isn't it because I mean even if you're not entirely in love with it there must be a seduction there of course there is of course there is and how did and how did you walk away from that is, is always the biggest key factor in in most people's lives when it mm. comes to the fact that you can see what you've got in front of you mm. um, and you can see where it can go mm. and that greed for for fame for money for attention mm. you know we live in a society that is very much driven by self and quick gratification mm. that's what we want we want everything mm. now and we want to be you know feeling very happy about what we've got yeah. and you know it is difficult to walk away but sometimes you just have to know yourself well enough to mm. go that's not for me and I'm off yeah. Uh, it's a funny thing. I was talking yesterday with my friend Luke Goodwin and uh, I was saying that I was meeting you today and, and obviously told him a little bit about you. And we started having this discussion about celebrities being the face of musical theatre now and whether or not that kind of destroys the integrity of the musical or adds to it. I mean, what do you feel about that? It's all about bums on seats. Yeah. <laughs> and if that's what it takes to get them on, on, on people in, then I totally understand that. Yeah. The difficulty I have with it is that you're taking away real opportunity for other young people, for other adults, for other people to, to Where this is their experience. Life. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you've set the benchmark so high that you 
you, your audition, you're now, you know, it used to be that you would go and do five auditions, you'd get one out of those, and mm. that would keep you going for six months or a year. Mm. Now you're going to 50 auditions mm. and not getting any of them. And mm. that's a whole different, you know, kind of ballpark for people to that are certainly coming into the arts, but those that are already in the arts, it's made life a lot more difficult. Yeah. So I think I, I value the fact that these celebrities are there because they're promoting... And, and kind of bigging up the whole industry, and it does mm. need that. But I think it's been done in the wrong way. Yeah, I think I agree, and I think Luke would agree as well. <laughs> I mean, some of them are incredibly talented, like yes, Beverly Knight, for absolutely. instance, fantastic in The Bodyguard, um, which is one of the productions, obviously, that you've you've worked on in, the, in your <laughs> time. Um, so obviously, as a, as a vocal coach as well, when you're faced with that situation where maybe someone's come in more for their face than their voice... What is the demand on you? I mean, how do you work with that? How do you get them uh, shipshaped so, for it's that? It's so difficult. I mean, usually I get called in to come and polish the act. Yeah. And I, I'm talking about the ensemble, the, the kind of group, not so much the individual. But mm. when they have artists that are not singers, but they're just big names, yeah. I get to spend a lot of time with them. And the difficulty I have is that, you know, you can bring a horse to water and you can't make it drink. And mm. it's that same thing with those sorts of people. You can... You can teach them everything they know mm. but if they're not passionate about it theatre you have to feel yeah. you have to expose yourself and immerse yourself into it and if you can't do that if it's not an interest to you, you it's not going to shine yeah and that's the reality and so you know I'll yell at them if they're famous or not yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, it, if that's what it takes and I'll spend 100 hours with someone even though I'm only being paid for 10 yeah. if that's what it takes to get it right but I try and I mean I turn back down now because yeah. I think it's, uh, I only want to do what I want to do. And sometimes I can't, if I know I can't achieve what I need to achieve, I'd rather walk away than be seen to be this yeah. individual that hasn't quite done it because that affects my career. Yeah. Um, but also, it doesn't give me any gratification knowing that there's a production out there that's shambolic. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it, it is, it's a shame. And I think it's a shame for just the, the theatres in general, isn't it, really, when it, it isn't quite pulled off. And, and I know it's, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because most of the time, it will work. Yeah. But some of the time, it, it can affect the whole musical for an entire run. Yeah. And uh, I won't name any names, but I've, I've seen a couple of musicals in the Theatre Royal um, where the celebrity face has disappointed me. And I haven't gone for that reason. I've just gone because I love the musical. And I've walked away going, what, what have I just been a part of? That's two hours I can't get back. And and you just think, you know what, you, you don't have to be a jack of all trades when you're a celebrity. Just stick to what you know and do, and that, do it do well. It well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So moving on a little bit. Sure. Um, to to some of the great projects that you've worked on. Can you remember your favourite project and why did you love it so much? Um, so I, I was involved in BBC's Let It Shine. Um, oh. and for, for the listeners that don't know anything about Let It Shine, do you want to explain? Yeah, sure. So it was um, the, the kind of TV child of Gary Barlow um, and it was very much about um, putting together a group of people into a band that would appear in a musical afterwards, <laughs> um, which was a musical about Take That. And so that was really fun um it was a really nice bit of work something I didn't expect to get involved in again and I, I've made some really really good friends from that which ultimately has led to what I'm doing now and all of the work that I've been able to do so that that's been really cool um and actually to see the artists that are already polished come out and show what they can do and, mm. and even I sometimes would go I can't teach you anything I can't do anything you're better than I could possibly imagine. <laughs> the student has surpassed the master. Yeah, sure. And sometimes it will just come down to what the public want rather yeah. than, than, you know, and like the only advice that I can, again, give to any kind of like, you know, anyone that was on the show really was, was you know, don't take it to heart because mm. what the public want at that moment in time, they want one in five minutes time, it yeah. changes. The industry changes. So, but that was amazing. <laughs> oh, I'm so inspired to hear you talk about that. It was a wonderful show as well. Um, okay, so if you could work on any uh, musical in the future, which one would it be? I wouldn't. I'd write one. 
<gasps> Ooh! So I get commissioned. Quite, uh, I've, I've had about four commissions now today. Fabulous. Of turning um, kind of straight Shakespeare plays into mm-hmm. musicals, um, which is really fun. Gotta love you, Will Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> so, 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 uh, and also some some smaller commissions for smaller community groups, and I always love getting involved in those because it's just a bit of fun. But um, so I, I would rather write something from the, the kind of bone up to do mm-hmm. something really cool that I want to do, rather than working on something that's been around for a while and they've already had their kind of lasting legacy put into that yeah I want to do something on my own <laughs> and I think that must be so rewarding as well if you're there on opening night and you're like oh is it gonna go down well is it not I mean how does that feel when you're sat in the audience at something that you've written Horrific. yourself <laughs> There's nothing worse. Um, I think anyone that that says that it's great and that you know honoured and all of this is lying. <laughs> you sit there in anticipation, waiting for someone to hate it, oh. and waiting for the eyes to roll, waiting for people to go. That was terrible. And in theatre, especially in the West End, mm. it, it, that's what people do. It's very <laughs> fickle there. Isn't it is, it? Um, and you have to have really thick skin, and it's something that that I'm not used to. So, um, yeah. <laughs> If you could listen to one song for the rest of your life, what would it be? Oh, easy, Rocket Man. Rocket Man. I want to go Why? up there. I want to go up there. <laughs> I'm fascinated by space. Fascinated by what what's uh, beyond our reach. Yeah. So I think for me. Um, you know, I, I love the music of Elton John anyway. He's always been a big inspiration to me. Um, but but that song just kind of says it all, really. So <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> Your infinite possibilities. Yeah, exactly. Drum roll, as I'm sure. Um, what do you think has been your proudest moment so far? Um, I think there's two. Professionally, um, it's been... <laughs> Doing some of the the TV work has been amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think my real proudest moment is when I send my music to my mum and say, what do you think? (laughs) I think for me, that's that's a real gold spot because she's brutally honest. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But actually, you know, my first album, when I sent that to her and I packaged it all up and posted it, and uh, she was over the moon. So for me, that's my proudest moment. But professionally, <laughs> professionally, it's it's got to be the book TV work. But yeah, yeah. It's just oh, that's the <laughs> loveliest answer I think I've ever received. <laughs> it's really <laughs> lovely. Being that I'm very close to yeah. my mum as well, <laughs> Mama Savage, you are a legend. Um, okay, so I mean, you mentioned earlier that you've you've worked on The Voice, and I was quite interested in the story of how you got there. So, how did you land that job? Well, <laughs> I, I, a really good friend of mine um, kind of dropped dropped everything in life to go and work at the BBC and um, I kind of lost contact with him until he sent me an email and she called me and desperately and said you need to look at this sent me an email for an internal vacancy for a vocal coach and I wasn't it didn't really say what show it was for they just wanted a vocal coach Um, and then through kind of you know um, he did a little bit of digging to find out that it was on The Voice and um, it was internal only but he said apply 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 so I did and um, I had heard nothing for a long time and all of a sudden I got a phone call off this kind of madman I'm gonna say um <laughs> who just ranted down the phone at me that he tried every other person on the planet and couldn't get anyone and would I come up and do the work <laughs> and reminded me that I was the last choice <laughs> and I would be paid accordingly <laughs> and me being me said I can't wait <laughs> So I went up and did a day and it was all kind of exciting and there's these, all these people there and um, I didn't meet anyone famous but I went up there and did it and then heard nothing and then a few weeks later I got another phone call, can you come back? Yes, all right. And then that ended, that was the end of that season um, and then I got this mysterious parcel in the post which basically was a proposed contract and a letter saying we'd like you for the following year, please sign here. Um, and I thought, yeah, hell yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I did, I think, two post yeah, two years at the BBC until the BBC went bye bye and yeah. um to kind of well actually <laughs> um the voice went bye bye to the BBC. <laughs> Not getting political there at all. <laughs> and uh I moved over to ITV. Mm. And obviously the whole show moved from 
um, London up to Manchester. Mm. So a whole new studio, a whole new kind of um, support team. Everything's different. Everything's more pressurised. And you can tell the difference um, between a commercial television station and a publicly funded one. But there's <laughs> a lot of differences. It's been really hard to integrate. Um, and then obviously we've hit COVID. Yeah. <laughs> and it's all come to a grinding halt. And my, my job is currently not happening yeah. um, because um, you've got to be in a support bubble um and i can't be because i've got other commitments down here so um i'm i'm not doing it this year um i i but i will be back next year i have contracts so yay (laughs) i'm so pleased that you're actually able to come back to your job because so many creatives are going through that struggle right now aren't they on every level (sighs) it's horrific um you know i've got many friends that are anything from you know studio hands to street performers and and i'm seeing and hearing it every day that there's not enough government support there's not enough um you know of of sort of of um ways that they can make money Mm. and you know it's a changing world and and i think for those that you know you've got the two types of creatives those that are kind of ahead of the game which are Mm. now changing the way they work Mm -hmm. and those that are kind of stuck in in what they've done and complaining about the lack of being able to do things and it is really difficult Mm. But, you know, I think anyone that's that's in that boat either is going to jump at an opportunity to try something different mm-hmm. and try and make a new living or not. I mean, it's devastating, isn't it? And, yeah. you know, speaking over the last, well, speaking over 2020, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to so many beautiful creative people, you know, people that are in your position, right down to those people that work on the streets, you know, no pun intended, but... Um, Every single person in the industry has been affected in a devastating way. Uh, I mean, even one of my friends, uh, he's a music engineer. He's got a young family. He's basically no one's booking in to his studio. He's been let go of his job in a major place in in Plymouth City. And by the end of November, will be homeless. Yeah. And, and it's literally down to that now for so many creatives. And when the um, when the campaign came out online with the, you know, Fatima has a future in cyber, <laughs> I Brilliant. mean, yeah. it, it kicked off, didn't it? It really kicked Just off nonsense, because... It's nonsense, honestly. It's, it's nonsense because when you're a creative-minded person, your brain doesn't work no. in the same way as, as someone who would thrive in that environment. We found what we wanted to do when, when we were younger and we went with it. And, Absolutely. And here we and are. And you'll find that... that exploring the creative mind you'll find that most creative people will do their main sort of thing but they'll have 50 other million things on the go because in order to stimulate your brain and and have a kind of fulfilling in life and actually stay creative yeah you'll end up doing lots of different things yeah you become a polymath absolutely as our previous (laughs) guest maggie batty would say um so i mean coming back to the voice what have you discovered about yourself working in that environment? Um, I'm not as tough as I thought I was. Really? <laughs> That's one of the things that really did hit me. Um, I think the first year I did it, I spent most of it crying. <laughs> why Why um, was that? Well, one, you know, what you see on television isn't what, what is real life. And mm. I'm not just talking about the voice here. I'm talking about a lot of creative arts. Mm. Behind the scenes, there's a lot of yelling, shouting, we've got to get this done, time frames to hit. The pressures um, must be immense. It, it, it's insane. And also, the, the biggest thing that I realised, I hate mornings. I'm not a morning person. <laughs> they start at 6am. I rock up at 10am. <laughs> You speak the for rebel. the majority, I think, <laughs> and, here in the And I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna lie, until I've had three coffees, there is no creativity coming out of this. <laughs> and you make a damn good yeah. coffee, I must say. <laughs> so so I think that's probably the, the kind of sort of things that I've learned. But you know, creatively, obviously I'm always learning. Mm. I, I don't ever stop and I, I look at other people and I'm jealous of what they can do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I wanna be more like them. So I'm always kind of, you know, surrounding myself with new people that mm. have different skills that I and kind of go mm. a bit of that, bit of that. Mm. Um, talking about the people that actually come on The Voice, um, I've, I've got a couple of students, well, one of them's on The Voice in Portugal at the moment, and the demands on her voice are insane. Yeah. So, I mean, from your expert opinion, how can someone who's maybe just manage to get a spot on the voice how can they look after their vocals through Um, that experience well i think the first thing before you audition for the voice you have to be certain that you a are bulletproof because Mm. they're going to chuck a lot of stuff at you anything from how you look to how you you sing all of that stuff so you've got to have this kind of bulletproof armor on in order to survive Mm. vocally it is very challenging you are 
practicing every day of the week mm. until you go live. Yeah. So if you're only singing every day for a half an hour, mm. you're going to struggle and you're mm. going to burn yourself out. So my recommendation is anyone that's getting up prepared to go to On The Voice or any other talent show like that, practice, practice, practice every day. Mm. You need to practice more than you would anything else in your life. Mm. And if you're on The Voice and you're now going, my vocals hurt, <laughs> um, honey, <laughs> lots of honey. Um, but also don't be afraid to say, look, I'm the artist, up yours, I'm stopping now. You know, the, you have to balance between having a great, great show and having a, a, a voice to be able to perform with. Mm. So you have to find that that middle ground. Don't abuse the voice. I would also say think about the key. Drop the key um, comfortably to what is comfortable for you. And, you know, everyone in the industry does it. And I know that people think it's a cheating way, but let's be honest, if a record is recorded in E-flat, they're going to perform it in probably G. Yeah. And that's just the reality. Um, so, you know, you have to safeguard yourself above everything and don't be scared to do that. As a vocal coach yes. in that in that environment, when someone comes in and they're insistent on singing it in the original key and you can see that they're struggling, how do you... How do you throw them out the door. <laughs> I don't put up with... If you want a coach that is going to be like, oh, you're okay, do what you want, yeah. go and find someone else. Yeah. <laughs> It's not going to happen. I'm tough boots because I know what I want to hear. Mm. So I have to understand you and your voice. Mm. So I spend a lot of my time, a bit like a stalker really, trying to understand you as the person because if I don't understand you as a person, I can't make you the best to be. Yeah. And yeah. then I have to, behind the scenes, do a lot of work with, with all of the other people around, you know, styling, around stage presence, around all of those things that are involved in, in that end package. Mm. So, again, I think it, it's it's understanding um, the artist, which enables them to, to move forward. Mm. But, you know, also the artists need to explore themselves. Yeah. I, at 28, started to realise what I was capable of. And it wasn't, you know, I spent many years just faffing around, doing a bit of cover here, cover there, writing a bit of this, a bit of that. And it's not until that you start to understand how your voice is an instrument and what works for you and what keys work for you and what styles work for you. Because I want the artist to tell me Give me mm. a run for my money. That's yeah. what I want. And it doesn't happen enough. But I do find that the people that go through to the semifinals and finals are the ones that are going, you, I want that song and I want it like that and you're going to make my voice do that. <laughs> Happy days, we can work. <laughs> Mic drop, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly I can tell that you're very passionate about getting the job done correctly. I mean, what pressures do you put upon yourself to do the best job that you can? Um, well, I look twice as old as I do now. <laughs> Don't we all love? Yeah. <laughs> um, for me, I, I will work as long and as hard as I can. Mm. I'm not going to run off at the first hurdle. I'm not going to, you know, say I'm only paid till five o'clock. If I have got to spend the whole night with an artist, which in some occasions I have, mm. I'll do that to make it work, mm. providing they're putting... The, the equivalent back in mm. because it's like any sort of relationship it's a two-way thing and vocal coach and artist is the same thing mm. and if they're doing that then I will do whatever I can do to make it good mm. and if I can't make it good I'll go and find someone that can because I'm not always the right coach for the right job mm. and sometimes I have to sit back and go I'd love to work with this person but I, I'm not the person for that yeah. and you know also I'll fight their corner if, if I have to you know on some occasions you'll get the star coming up and saying, I don't want that song, they're doing this. And I'm like, they're doing that and you can shut up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In that order. Um, you know, so I, I'll do whatever it takes to get the job done. I don't put my name to anything that I don't think is professional and good. If it's not, it's not happening. Because I can't, I, for me, as a creative, it, it's not about money, it's not about the, the fame, the glory, it's about delivering something that's lasting and mm. people are going to remember. Because then I know I've done my job right. And that's all I can ask for. That's a pretty good answer. Everything else is a byproduct. <laughs> <laughs> so what drives you, what, what motivates you to keep going in such a pressurised industry? Cash, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. It's actually the last thing I think about. Um, it's a perk. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to lie. <laughs> um, for me, it's... Um, what, what? Do you know, I took a huge risk when I, when I started to be, you know, to do this stuff for a living. I let my work go. I, I came out of a secure job into nothing. Mm. Um, and I used every penny I had to try and fund 
you know, the, the transition. And so for me, I have to keep remembering that if I stop, <laughs> I'm, I haven't got, you know, anything to fall back on. Mm-hmm. So for me, I, I, I want to make this work because I have to partially, mm-hmm. but also because I want, my, you know, most people want to leave some sort of legacy. And for me, it's knowing that there's stuff out there that I've done that maybe not everybody knows about and maybe people don't know who I am, but that doesn't mm-hmm. matter because that content is out there for it that exists. period and it exists forever and that's all i can ask i i i feel a bit of a sort of spirit animal moment with you when you say legacy that that is one word that for me personally i'm always mindful about in the back of my mind whenever i'm doing anything whether it's from a poem to to coaching someone who i know is going to go on into the future and do great things that legacy that word i it drives me. It's a wonderful word for any artist. And like you said yourself, if you throw yourself in 100%, hopefully, hopefully fingers crossed, will stick somewhere. something will <laughs> stick. So, I mean, talking about that and talking about that drive, how do you feel that music has, first of all, helped your mental health, but helps and benefits sure. other people's? Um, well, I wouldn't be who I am without it. And, mm. you know, anyone that, that, that knows me knows that most of my time is spent making music and mm. you know i i harmonize with everything i drive all the time <gasps> i'm a harmonize. demon harmonizer oh, people get, get so of sick of it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people won't get in the car with me because they're yeah, like you're yeah. just gonna make noise because <laughs> it's not the melody line no, they get exactly. really upset yeah. don't and they? they're like what, what are you doing what are you doing <laughs> it's just a casual yeah. third <laughs> 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 so I love that. And that, that for me is really important. But, you know, mental health is a massive area. Mm-hmm. And, you know, music can have two very dramatic, uh, dramatical impacts on someone. It can lift someone to positivity, to happiness, but it can also have the reverse effect. Mm-hmm. Depends what you listen to and depends what, what your state of mind is at that time. But I know if I listen to um, to something really kind of, of, of dark or heavy mm-hmm. metal, that's going to put me in a different place to if I'm listening to something classical or something jazz or Mm. I mean jazz makes everyone happy (laughs) Uh, so I I think you know that there there is a a a massive link there between mental well-being and uh, music Mm. and and for those people that play instruments you know I can be angry and and sad and you know I remember on the the beginning of March this year Mm. when my livelihood just went (laughs) bye-bye and all of a sudden I'm thinking what am I gonna do Mm. and I sat down and played piano for half an hour and I felt good yeah. And, you know, that, I know it's always a fallback, it's always there, and I don't care how f- bad things get. You know, I've, I've failed miserably in the past, and I've, I've you know, been kicked out of houses and all sorts. So yeah. I've been there, and the piano's always got me through it. So. <laughs> <laughs> do you, what do you feel about people that are slightly older? So, for instance, my dad, he's 67. All right, Steve Savage. Um, And he's always had this thing in the back of his mind that he'd love to play violin. I mean, obviously, it's a very technical instrument. It's not one that you can just pick up and suddenly you can make a sound. Do you think that there is a cutoff point in the way that your brain learns an instrument in terms of age or do you think you can pick one up at any point and start practicing I think and the only it? thing that holds you back from anything in your life is you mm. um, and frankly you know I mean I learned the piano when I was 20 odd um, I learned the cello when I was 28 29 mm. I don't think there's any you know you're limitless as as it comes down to your kind of drive and passion mm. and yeah you know if if you're three years old and you're, you know, if, if, just as an example, um, there's a Japanese program called the Suzuki program. And that when you learn violin, it's bow on, bow off, bow on, bow off. And they'll do that a thousand times a day to get that perfect position. And, you know, yes, they're going to be very talented and very good at what they do. Mm-hmm. But, you know, just because someone's, you know, 90 or 80 or whatever they are, mm-hmm. why should that stop them? The only mm-hmm. hindrance is, is their own... Mindset. Mm. If you tell yourself you can do something, you can do it. Unless it. you jump out of a window and say you can fly. Then <laughs> perhaps not. <laughs> Don't take that advice literally <laughs> in terms of learning an instrument. <laughs> Just go and do it. <laughs> there might be so many people through lockdown that are feeling that as well. Um, talking of lockdown, uh, you know, and we're talking about instruments now, what is a simple instrument that maybe those that are going into lockdown now could just pick up and start to learn in the next 30 days. Teaspoons, go on, give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know, like guitar's really easy, ukulele's really easy, just something to get to grips with. Mm. They're not particularly difficult. Get some percussion if that's your thing. I'm anti-percussion, so that's not my thing. <laughs> um, 
I, I, yeah, I tried drums once and failed miserably. I've got no rhythm in me whatsoever. Um, <laughs> so that's that's not for me. But, you know, there's so many different things that you can try. I wouldn't say a recorder because you'll probably break it in half within 10 minutes. But, um, you know, if you want something nice, something simple, go for a guitar. I mean, mm. you can pick them up in, in charity shops, out of the paper, out of Facebook site or wherever, whatever platform you're looking to buy from. Mm. And, and they don't have to cost a lot. Yeah. And, you know, I've got over in my collection of instruments over there, one guitar that was about £20 and one that was £1,000. And if I'm honest, they yes, do I the same thing. <laughs> Not that I'm eyeing them up and thinking yeah. I might sneak one out when I finish. Um, um, okay, so I've got to flip you on your head now. I love asking this question because it's always so varied. If you were to die tomorrow and be reincarnated, I mean, you practically have already, Ooh, yeah. <laughs> what three <laughs> things, memories or skills, would you take into the next um, life? Piano and singing because I couldn't live without them and I couldn't die without them. I've got to have them. <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, I'm going to say compassion because everybody needs compassion. Mm -hmm. You're no one if you haven't got that. Um, and... I think maybe learning mm. just as a as a skill, being able to learn, and that is a skill. <laughs> yeah. Um, because you know, you shouldn't ever stop learning. Um and we're learning every day. We're learning every time we meet someone, you know, we're processing information. So to be able to do that is a blessing. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Okay. So talking about your gorgeous guitar collection, it is I mean it's it's sexy. I'm gonna say that. I'm just gonna say that is a sexy guitar collection. What do you geek out about in your job? So pianos. Oh, I get offers all the time. Come to this factory, look at this. Come, and they email me all the time and I'm like, I want to, but I can't. Um I love pianos, I love technology, so putting mm. those two things together. Um and guitars. I mean, I've got those there and I've got in the back room another six or seven that are hidden away, the nice ones that I, I don't want to get out the case because they'll transform in light. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, there's another piano in that room over there, actually. So, so I'd say uh, guitars and pianos are the things that I geek out about. And, you know, whenever there's a trade show, whenever there's a music shop, mm. I stop and I have a look. Um, that's just how it is. <laughs> are you in love with a certain brand? Are the brands are available, but is there one that you go back to again and again and again? Um, yes. Yamaha sponsorship, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, in terms of pianos, I think anything electric instrument, I always buy Yamaha. Mm. Um, I think Yamaha make the most fabulous kind of keyboards out there. Um, there are other things, of course. Um, <laughs> but but I, I, I'm not particularly driven by brand. I don't wear branded clothing where I can. I don't, I don't buy an instrument based on a brand. I buy mm. it on sound. on sound and quality. Yeah. Um, and on how it connects with me. When I touch it, mm. I sort of get a feeling of, of, and I'll play it for a few minutes, I'll know if it's right or wrong. Mm. You know, most people buy the piano I've got and put it in a studio because that's the standard that the studios want. Mm. I buy it because I played it and went, that's the one for me. And I can tell you that I played pianos worth three times the amount of that and the salesman going, oh, you need this one. And I said, no, I need that one. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not driven by brand at all. I just think it's just off how, what, what impact it has on me. And if it has the right impact, it's coming home. <laughs> Do you name your instruments? No, do you know, I, ha I have in the past, um, but I don't anymore because there's too many of them and I get confused. <laughs> <laughs> I only ask because I, I have this saxophone at home. I love playing sax. I'm a saxophone teacher. And, um, and it's an, a really old 1950s silver saxophone and it's pretty shoddy. It breaks all the time but I'm in love with it. It's got its own soul. And again and again and again, I'll look at, you know, better saxophones. And I've had better saxophones in, in the past, but always I come back to that. And it is literally my baby. And I'm really, really attached to I it. I also think they get better with age, most instruments. I think so too. I think if you buy a new instrument, you might be disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> now, every company that sells new ones is going to help me. <laughs> but um, but I think, and especially something like a piano, a saxophone, anything that, that can physically change its shape as, as it expands mm. with heat or with, with time, um, will naturally resonate differently over the years. So, mm. Do you have any instruments that have a good backstory? Oh, yes, I do, actually. Um, I'm not going to name the artist, but I will show you just so you know who I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> I owned their piano in white, um, beautiful grand piano, and I had it for um, many years, and they they got rid of it, and I bought it. 
<laughs> and it, it sat right here until not that until actually um, this one came along. But um, it was superb instrument, and it was signed, which made it a bit more special to me. I was going to ask. Um, <laughs> and then when I met that individual through my creative work down the line. Mm. They said to me, you've got my piano. And I was like, oh, what? <laughs> Thinking, have I stolen one that I'm not aware of? <laughs> um, so that, that piano had a lot of story, but it didn't connect with me in the same way that this one does. It's so weird, isn't it? Because, yeah, it can come from anyone. It can have any story, but if it's not yours, it's, it's, not, yours. it's not yours. It's yeah. not yours. Oh, that's really cool <laughs> to hear. I was in a band once with um, with a guitarist who had a guitar from one of the guys from Muse. And uh, he, he won't mind him saying that because they're good friends, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And again, it was the same situation. He It wasn't his. It wasn't his. And he was gutted because he really wanted what to keep it. Like, yeah. But it wasn't <laughs> his. Um, okay, so if you were to meet yourself at 10 years old and sit him down and tell him about your life now and give him a piece of advice, what would you say? Well, I'd say to him, don't smoke, don't drink. <laughs> um <laughs> to avoid that that period of life full stop yeah <laughs> um but also not to take things for granted and it's something that we all do and i think you know as you you whatever your career is whatever you work in as you kind of get a promotion you 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 a lot of people start to feel like oh i'm, I'm actually really good at this and just starting that little bit of like self greed really about i'm quite special and in the arts it's really easy to fall into that category of i've made it now this is what i am mm. and i would tell myself that that you know you never make it anywhere mm. you're you're there for a period enjoy it while you can because i know it's not going to be there forever mm. i think that's the best advice i have to give myself i love it i just I, I don't see the point in in you know if i can be as modest as possible that's great because I don't, I don't want anything back from people i don't want people to go oh you're brilliant mm. they can keep those reviews to themselves <laughs> <laughs> I feel you, brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, talking about people coming into the industry, maybe they're, you know, teenagers considering going on The Voice or maybe they're teenagers thinking about a career in musical theatre. I mean, what advice would you give them for just starting out, whether it be the educational process they should try and get themselves or whether it should be the emotional process? You know, I, I've never been, you know, and I, I educated myself late in life because I went mm. to go and study music at 28. Mm. Um, I, I, I think from a, a know your craft, understand your instrument, whether or not that's your voice, whether or not you want to be a graphic designer or an artist or whatever it is you want to do in life, you have to know your craft and know it well because that's what will get you through. That's what will make you money. When everyone else is turning, closing doors on you, that's what you'll come back to. Mm. And also have a fallback plan. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm a, a qualified IT technician and I, I've got qualifications in car mechanics and all sorts. And, I, and even now, I find myself revisiting those sort of things because, mm you know life changes the world goes on and if you only know one thing you'll get to the point where you're like what do I do now how do I survive so you have to have that and I think just having a backbone because you have no one's going to hand anything to you on a plate if you think mm. that if you if your aim is to get famous don't bother mm. you, your aim has to be to do something cool and if you do that you'll go somewhere do you think um, I'm going to ask a gender question here. Mm. Do you think it's harder for women or men or even people that are gender fluid? I mean, is yes, it different? I think it, that it is, yeah. What, I, what do you think the differences are? I, I, I genuinely think if you're going to pick one industry where there's the highest level of gender equality, it's the arts. Yeah. And I, I have no doubt about that. You know, the, the television, the media is still very much the, the male-driven zone. Mm. And I think there's a lot of work to be done around um, gender equality. And for those that are trans, or, or, or gender free or whatever they want to kind of whatever category they fit into for those it's really difficult mm. because no one wants to give them time all day because mm. people see themselves as they see themselves so yeah. you know if, if the producers are thinking they're not like me I don't want them and it's a huge issue and I, I don't know what the solution is I think you know maybe you for can write people for that, them. <laughs> yeah for people that are so liberal apparently and so sort of um you know creative i would think that they would have an understanding mm. that everybody's different and how they look how they dress how they are as a person shouldn't affect their ability to deliver on on what they're doing so 
it's horrible and i think you know and and also if you're a, if you're a, a female coming up through the ranks especially in television mm. it's horrific they ask you know you to do things that you're not comfortable with um put you in difficult situations and i've seen and heard a lot of this so mm. i i can you know i can say firsthand that i think is not acceptable and the industry needs to change do you think then it would be better for these people that are being discriminated against to really hold their ground in who they are, or do you think that they should try and change to fit the the mould that is? Stand out, scream out, because if nobody screams out, if everybody just bends over and goes, you know, this is what it is, I'll work with it, it'll mm-hmm. never change. It will never change. And the thing is, you know, when we look at, at, at where we've come, you know, from the likes of, of, you know, slavery and how we've overcome that to where we are now, and I'm not saying by far we're perfect because we've got mm. miles still left in, in, in racial equality. But if we take that as an example, then, you know, people screw up, stood up and said enough's enough. Mm. And if no one does that, that change will never come. So I think it's crucial that people stand up and say, do you know what, this isn't right. And if that means losing your job over it, good grounds to sue. Yeah. <laughs> but, but no, joking aside, if that's what it takes to, to have a lasting change, you'll be remembered for that far long than the person that's just gone, oh, I'll, I'll just do whatever they ask. Yeah, I mean, you look at Ellen DeGeneres, one of my Absolutely. personal heroes, yeah. um, and that's exactly what she did. Um that's a that's a really wonderful thing to hear and, and quite refreshing to have an uncensored view on the situation. Um, we're coming to the end of this particular podcast. I'm definitely going to have you again in the future because I could talk to you for years, it seems. But since we're ending in such a brave conversation, what do you consider to be your bravest moment personally? Um... I've walked out of productions. Um, and there's one in specific where um, I was working with a so-called celebrity. Can I say <laughs> that? Can I get away with that? <laughs> um, I wasn't getting anywhere. And, and the reality is, is I wasn't comfortable where the production was going. Mm. And I had a lot of money riding on it going, if I don't do this, I might be in trouble. Mm. And I walked out of it. And do you know what? I don't regret that decision. I think it's the best thing I ever did. Um and you know when when in anything creatively if you're not comfortable with it walk away because it, it it's not going to benefit you in any way mm-hmm. and you know yes you lose some things and yes you lose other things and you know but you'll recover and come back in a different way. And this is all about reinventing yourself. You know, at the start of the year when everything, it was like some sort of explosion and that was the end of it. <laughs> My work was gone. I had to reinvent myself and think, mm-hmm. actually, I've got no income now. How do I make money? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I decided my approach was to go and hound people in television and think <laughs> about how could I transfer my skill set into something more television-based. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so from writing theme tunes to thinking about, you know, the music that goes alongside most television, it all needs music and someone has to cut and edit and do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually just selling myself as a person. Um, so I think, you know, if in any context, you need to do that. Mm-hmm. And that's, for me, I guess the... Uh, I've got another brave moment because I could have just gone I've got some savings I'm just going to ride this period out uh, or go and get a job in McDonald's or whatever it <laughs> takes um, you know or you say I've got to reinvent myself and this is how I'm going to do it good answer <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so much Anytime. for this pleasure. wonderful interview. <laughs> I've so enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Would you mind playing just a little tinkle on the piano just to play us out? I'll do a little bit. Go we'll, for it. We, we may have to relocate though. <laughs> bass strings. <laughs> <laughs> I had such a good time with Darren and really warmed to his honest and open nature. I could have talked to him for hours. 
I love that despite his success in his field, he remains humble and maintains his integrity. I deeply respect that. Darren reminds us that if you are passionate about something, chase it. If that means having to work two or three jobs or you have to practice every day for a big competition in order to take stepping stones towards your dreams, then do it. You never know what may turn up in that time. He, like myself and many creatives, need the mental stimuli of many different activities to remain balanced and happy. That may make it hard to describe what you do to other people sometimes. And there is a lot of taboo about people with multiple jobs being too impulsive or indecisive or a jack of all trades and master of none. But actually, it usually just means you have a vivid imagination that needs to express itself by being exercised in different directions. Personally, if people ask, I just call myself a creative or, like our previous guest Maggie Vassy says, a polymath. Darren also reminds us that you can pick up something new to learn at any age. It is only our mindset that dictates how we do. For example, my husband's grandmother picked up the Spanish guitar in her 80s with arthritic fingers. And because she was absolutely determined to succeed, she did. There are many out there who get to retirement and take up things like sculpting and painting or even glass blowing. But why wait? If you can dream it, you can absolutely go for it. You just have to believe you are capable and make the time to learn and not let other people's ideas of what you can or can't do stop you. Talking of which, it was very interesting to hear about gender inequality today. In Darren's own words, be loud and proud about who you are. Shout it from the rooftops and don't let discrimination stop you. Don't feel like you have to mould yourself to fit something or someone's outdated idea. You may be the next gender fluid newsreader or the next trans ballet dancer. In order to shape the world into a more inclusive, better adjusted reality, we all need to do our best to voice who we are and stand confidently in that place. If that means turning down a job or leaving a production that makes you feel uncomfortable, the best thing you can do for everyone is stand up for yourself and all you represent. It was also refreshing to hear that Darren takes a tough love approach when working with those he is coaching. If you're new to the vocal technician field, have your end game in mind. Listen to the person's voice and guide them directly and assertively towards their best version of themselves. When I began mentoring singers, I made the mistake of listening to overly ambitious parents, singers who weren't willing to change their bad habits, and even some celebrities who would take offence to constructive criticism. Knowing your craft, not comparing yourself to others, and being a concise and firm leader brings success to both parties, guaranteed. If you are confident and have the best person's interest at heart, everyone wins in the end. Darren is living proof that if you're proud to put your name to the work you've done, then you've mastered the journey to get there. No matter the sweat, blood and tears it has taken. Diamonds and created under pressure, my friends. So what have I learnt? Be a little bit more bulletproof. Remain curious and as a person who identifies as female, don't let my age, my gender or even my hair colour or anything else be the weapon that others choose to shoot me down or decrease my chance of success. My mindset is and forever will be the only thing that has my permission to determine who I am and what I reach for. In the words of Jim Rohn, let others lead small lives but not you. Let others argue over small things, but not you. Let others cry over small hurts, but not you. And let others leave their futures in someone else's hands, but not you. Oh, and if you happen to be in Switzerland, try the sweet braided bread. Next week on the show, we meet the artist behind the collection, Before We Became Women, We Were Girls, poetess and exhibiting artist, Becky Nuttall. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the show. If you have a spare moment now, please like, subscribe and tell me your thoughts in the review, which will really help other people like yourself to find the show. Of course, you can also share with your friends and follow us at the Brave Moment Podcast 2020 on Instagram or the Brave Moment Podcast on Facebook. 
If you're interested in getting in touch, pop on over to the therapy page Coping to Mastery on Facebook or via the website copingtomastery.org. It's been so wonderful to have you all here with me again. Please get in touch with the show with your own stories. And don't forget, your brave moment starts now.